The days of working in drab office environments are coming to an end, thankfully. In this segment of Frame, we will learn more about the role that design plays in creating office furniture and interior environments, as well as how design influences the way we feel and how we function in the workplace. Joining me is Vice President of Tallgrass Business Resources, Phil Wasta. Hi, Eva. Hi, Phil. Thanks for being on Frame. Thanks for coming to the showroom. Let's talk design. Let's talk furniture. Let's talk technology. I'm ready. Okay. I know you've been around this industry your entire life. Basically. Basically. And it's a given that if you have an office, you have furniture. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious to find out from your expert viewpoint, how has the role of furniture changed in the workplace over the past few decades? What we're finding is that the from an ownership perspective, there's the difference between treating furniture as a necessary evil to conduct business versus an asset through which you can be, uh, have a more productive workforce. So with that kind of as the backdrop, um, those who are looking for ways for uh, a more productive workforce are going to also incorporate furniture into that planning. They're going to incorporate furniture into the design so that so that you know the productivity can in increase the Dilbertville era that is now mm. quite frankly starting to come to an end and I don't mean that unilaterally but if you ask the younger generation coming in mm -hmm. to to the working world the reaction you'll get from them is I would not work there they they will not be hidden away boxed up and isolated from the rest of the workforce it's just not an environment they wish to work in with the advent of technology which you know, th throughout the conversation, you keep, I will keep dropping into technology because mm -hmm. that's what's driving a lot of this. We've gone through the Dilbertville and the cubicle, and now we're getting back to open office again, but in a much uh, different dynamic. Instead of everybody facing the same way, mm -hmm. now we're talking interactive. One of the terms being used is benching. Okay. Uh, but where you, you provide a, a workforce the ability to interact with each other uh, visually, physically, really within the environment and don't try and separate them out because there's more that can be achieved through collaboration than without. True. Let's move to personalized environments to make it more home-like with the intention of maybe people feeling more comfortable, happier. Right color trends, style trends. Splashes of color, warmer tones, earthier tones, anything that has some connection to nature. In reality, I think all five senses with the exception of taste, I haven't seen a flavored chair yet, but uh, well, it might be who coming. knows, it might be coming. <laughs> They're definitely trying to uh, appease, not appeal, but appease all of the senses. In use of pattern, if you watch any of the popular shows today, you're seeing more and more pattern embedded into the floor. 80, well, probably greater than 80% of the commercial flooring market is done in carpet tile, the, the oh, like three the foot modular? by three foot, right, mm -hmm. okay. uh, such as our floor here. Mm -hmm. And so what you see is uh, what's called ashlar setting or, or uh, where they parquet the floor. Mm -hmm. But there's mm -hmm. all sorts of different ways to lay that, that uh, modular flooring so that you not only get a field of, of durability, the carpet mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. but you also get a, a visual factor worked in and uh, the carpet designers in that industry are coming out with such cool patterns to play mm -hmm. with that it's no longer this monolithic field of 12 foot wide roll goods stuck to right. the floor. It's something more dynamic. Is Shay going to come back to the workplace? Shag, <laughs> only at your house. <laughs> only at my house. Well, I have hardwood floors, but I could get some shag rugs. There's a shag carpet for you. <laughs> Well, I thought we might uh, take a look at this product to kind of tie a bow around some of the things mm -hmm. we talked about earlier. In Steelcase's ongoing research and development, one of the things that is, is a huge uh, drive for them is to embed technology into the furniture. And uh, with, again, flat screen technology, the yes. fact that technology is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller becomes very possible in ways that it was never possible before. The Mediascape product, what, it, what makes it unique is Let's say we are in that corporate or education collaborative environment, mm -hmm, and, and mm -hmm. quite frankly, one of the one of the markets that this is taking off the fastest is in colleges and universities, where a group of students walk up with their laptop, oh. they plug in to the what's called the puck. When you have two or more users and you're sharing information live, you don't have to forward it or download it or, or, right. or put it on a jump drive. You tap the puck, and and the information that's on your screen goes up to the to the television. 
or you can do split screen where where you're you're doing side by side information with uh -huh. with uh, again two people. I've seen these with arrays as, as many as four monitors. Wow. As you can see, you can also do a camera so that this could be uh, linked over the web where you're doing an interactive meeting, sharing information uh, over the web, and also having that visual contact uh, with, with each other at the meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, again, technology getting smaller in its, mm -hmm. in its second mm -hmm. version. There's Mediascape uh, Mobile, where rather than being tied to a table, it's a unit that you could roll around to multiple rooms, bringing the technology to the people instead of the people to the technology. What other environments have been transformed because of design? And I'm thinking education and healthcare. Two of the largest growth markets mm -hmm. uh, for our industry, driven by technology. Uh, one of the one of the devices that uh, we just saw come out is a mobile cart for doctors to take throughout the hospital, and their iPad would be mounted to the cart, oh. so that they didn't have to carry it. They, you know, it could be referred to constantly, but they would have use of both hands. Hospitals are converting over to paperless records right. and transferable. Uh, patient information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all done uh, now over the air, not even over the wire because it's done Wi-Fi off their intranet. Mm -hmm. And so the doctor has that information following them everywhere they go. How is the industry addressing the way that kids learn today or facilitating some of their, their needs? Again, same horse, technology. We want a, a technologically savvy workforce. We want kids coming through who are plug and play, if you will, coming into the workforce, uh, being able to utilize technology. And so laptops are starting to be incorporated you know, in, in uh, elementary school. Even though I was a model student, they have put me in the corner. However, I am in this new, really, really functional and well-designed, educational, personal, personal unit. What do I call this, Phil? It's just a chair. It's just a chair? <laughs> no, it's more than a chair. Essentially, it's designed specifically for the high school and higher education market, colleges and universities. And what they did is they took the old fixed tablet chair, which many of us sat at in high school, and in they, the 50s? yeah, and, and it goes all the way around. <laughs> uh, but they took that standard fixed tablet chair and did some things that bring it to today. Backpack holder at the bottom, uh, so that oh. uh, the, the kids can bring their backpack with them. It isn't hanging over the back of, of their chair, impeding the person behind right. them. Right. And they have access to it below. Uh, and then the tablet itself is much larger than what you found earlier, so that you have room yeah. for your computer and a little bit of, of writing space, but uh, larger for, for laptops, and then rather than being fixed, can be swung around to oh. the side to get in and out instead of torquing yourself in and out right, of those right. fixed tablets. Oh, this is great. And then it's not, not exactly rocket science, but one of the other things that they incorporated later, of course, was the, the uh, cup holder. All the kids are carrying you know, water bottles or, sure. or uh, energy drinks or whatever it is that they have, and instead of setting it down on the floor, getting kicked over, right. it's something that, that can be incorporated in or tucked away and out of the way. Oh, so, and adjust it around the and space. And then as, as you uh, were showing, it swivels. Yes, I like uh, that. That's this my model favorite does, pop. and also it is on wheels. So uh, one of the things that a lot of the professors are doing is rather than uh, everything being rowed in, in fixed environments, mm -hmm. you can go from classroom style, everybody facing forward sure. receiving the message, to then break out because more and more classes are, are being taught in a manner where the kids break up into groups. Right, right. So they can literally just roll their chairs over into groups as opposed to dragging the fixed arms Yeah, across. I remember that. Now I days. have heard the concern of chair races out in the hallway and I think you might be a problem with that. Um, not me. <laughs> not you. Oh, that's I would right, you were a model. I'm a model student to that's this right. day. You would say go. I would say go. <laughs> and I would be on the lookout to make sure no one got caught. Exactly. But I, would, I wouldn't participate. No. No. Mm -mm. Hey. No. You bet. Hey, you know what, Phil? I, I just got a Facebook update. I have to look at that. I'll be right, I'll be right with you, okay? Just one second, one second. What are, what are you doing? I'm writing you a note that says I have to leave. You can't write on this. It's like writing on the walls at oh, home. Oh, I can write on this. What? No. It's a collaborative table from Steelcase called Campfire. 
and you can write dry erase or you can take the glass off and write notes and then take the notes back to your desk. This is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I think you need one for your living room. I do. Okay, I want to write a note too, please. If you have to leave, then what? I have to tweet. <laughs> you have to tweet? I have to do my Facebook update and then tweet because it does have this. It's got Tweety Birds. Oh, very nice. All right, here's my note. Bill rocks. Thanks for coming today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for sharing your expertise on design and how the way we work is changing and how we feel about work is changing hopefully too. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. I don't know if I can keep up, but right now I'm going to get back to this. Okay. Thanks so much, Phil. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for tuning into this segment of Frame. Just as in apparel fashion that follows its own cycle of trends, colors, and styles, so does furniture fashion. There is one design period in particular that seems to continue to increase in desirability and prevalence. In this segment of Frame, we'll discuss mid-century mod furniture fashion with Dave Owens, owner of First Class Finds. Dave, thanks for being on Frame. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We're sitting here, we have our little fabulous mid-century mod setup. So before we get into detail, because you are the expert on it, give us an idea of what it is exactly. What is mid-century modern furniture? Uh, well, to me, I think uh, mid-century modern would definitely be between the time periods of uh, 1940s mm -hmm. through the 1970s. Um, modern furniture uh, dates back to the 1800s, um, really? but specifically, uh, mid-century modern is kind of its own genre, and um, that's kind of give or take. It could be um, late 30s, early 40s, and, and kind of even going into the late 70s. I love the 70s, as you know, <laughs> and I'm a big collector and fan of it. So what are the design elements in mid-century mod furniture? Easily identified, it's usually um, clean lines, mm -hmm. you know, very simple form, futuristic. I read also it's organic in nature, tying back to Fra Frank Lloyd Wright and how it should be a natural part of an environment. Is that an accurate assessment too? I think that's very true. And we have a table of a very significant designer as part of the mid-century mod movement, if you will, in decorative arts. And why don't you give us an overview about this table, please? Well, the designer is uh, Warren Platner, and he was a designer for Knoll. And um, he had a, uh, a, a line of this furniture, um, the wire table, and there was a dining table, yes. and, um, which would have been much larger, and it had wire chairs, much like this, all the way around it. And, um, it's, a, it's a desirable line. It's a highly coveted. I have friends, actually, who have that set, and it's absolutely beautiful. Who are some of the other prominent designers from the mid-century mod period? Well, I think probably at the forefront of most mid-century um, design conversations, you'd probably talk about Charles and Ray Eames. Oh, yes. Um, they were a husband and wife design team. Uh, Charles was an architect and Ray, his wife, was an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, together they, co they collaborated and um, their vision was to be able to produce large amounts of furniture that was also affordable. No longer was it only affordable for a certain class of, of people at home. So. And very functional as well. Very functional. Another highly coveted line. If you can find an Eames piece, you're, you're really, you're doing well in yes. great condition. And if you have them, keep them. <laughs> yes, really Unless great. you want to get your hands on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can always bring it down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry I interrupted you, what were you going to say? Oh, I just think, uh, yeah, the, the part of their mission and, and the reason why they're, they were at the forefront is because uh, they were doing something a little different, not something everyone was doing. Um, their furniture, their mission was to um, hold a high standard for quality mm -hmm. and also uh, design. Which still rings true to today. Do you have any idea why that period seems to be so popular right now? Well, I think there's a few different reasons for that. Um, as you mentioned, the, the quality of construction, I think, is something that's desirable to people mm -hmm. who maybe aren't so much of a mid-century 
collector as they are, somebody who wants quality furniture. The simplicity of the form, again, as you mentioned, um, really lends itself to a lot of different design schemes. Yes. I mean, you could, you could put modern furniture in a contemporary home and make it work really well. I have customers who have purchased older homes mm -hmm. and they're still able to work in a few key pieces and, oh. and still make it look right. In a more traditional environment. Yeah. yeah so. I think that's more of a trend now is uh, being able to do different things and not having to stick to just one type of furniture. If you can make it work and it looks good and you feel good in your home, then it works. And that's the key because that nesting, cocooning uh, trend is also very high, which may be that, as well as individuality. Every piece is so unique that you don't see it coming and going as you do in so many things like I likened it to apparel fashion and, and other furniture, modern furniture today. What exactly are the identifiers on, on pieces? There's a lot of uh, websites now that are catalogs of all the designers' furniture. Modernism book is a mm -hmm. is a great identification uh, guide to be able to give you a kind of an overview of what the designers were doing um, and a wide variety of different um, designers and companies. Did they stamp their furniture? Sometimes um, you will see it branded into the furniture. Oh, okay. uh, Haywood Wakefield, um, certain Danish companies uh, mm -hmm. actually stamped it, you know, into the furniture. Like a good old-fashioned like cattle brand, we yeah, have that have a nice little, identifier. Uh, bird mark on the bottom. Tags, you, you'll you'll oftentimes see tags maybe underneath uh, mm -hmm. uh, on, on the padding, mm -hmm. or, uh, and and sometimes you won't. Sometimes furniture that was uh, obviously from its age mm -hmm. uh, or being reupholstered may have lost the tag. So sometimes it's just kind of a, you have to do your research. How did you get started with mid-century mod? Well. Um, just from a, being a collector, I guess, you know, going around and finding bargains. Uh -huh. And um, I bought a house about nine years ago. It was built in 1956. And um, when I started seeing this furniture, it just seemed to fit. I wanted to, after I bought my first piece, I mm -hmm. bought a bedroom set, mm -hmm. um, a maple bedroom set. I've got birch um, trim, so it looked That's really gorgeous. nice. And next thing you know, I was, doing the uh, spare bedroom in the basement. <laughs> so that's kind of what got me into it. And once I, once I started seeing more and more of it, I guess it just turned into a hobby and an obsession, so. Who's your favorite designer? I really am a fan of uh, Charles and Reigns. I just like their originality, um, the, the artistic end of mm -hmm. what they did with their design. And I also, admire the fact that they wanted to produce it for everyone to be able to purchase. Yeah. And I've tried to adopt that in my own shop. I'd like to, I like to sell furniture um, to, to everyone that, that wants to have it in their home. What, what, what is love? Dave, these chairs, they kind of need to go home with me maybe. Yeah. Uh-huh. Tell us about these chairs. These I'm gonna are, get out because this These are another, are uh, another Herman Miller. Um, La Fonda chairs, uh, mm -hmm. really fun shape. These have been mm -hmm. recovered. They're not the original upholstery, but uh, they have fun colors, and uh, you can attest that they're very comfortable. Yes, and they, they are. Swivel. And that makes them really, really fun because yeah. you can mess around on these. And speaking of the the fabric, one thing about mid-century modern design is that most of the patterns and the fabric were really monochromatic, actually patternless. Isn't that true? Kind of ties into the the simplistic nature of the furniture. Sure. You don't sure. have to be too shy with the colors. You can get busy with the starburst clock, the owls. You have a little, what is this thing? It's like a Georgia O'Keeffe <laughs> piece, kind of. Well, I, some head. I really love furniture, but sometimes I just buy strange things as well. <laughs> um, it's great. I was in an antique shop and it was a spray painted cow head so um, I had to buy it. A cow head. Well I really know my animals don't I? <laughs> <laughs> All right well I see you were getting ready to whip up some fondue for us. Is yes. there anything else we should know about mid-century modern furniture? Well I, I think the thing to remember is to have fun with it. There's gonna be a lot of opportunities to buy fun stuff. Well, I'm excited. Again, I'm going to start working on my 15 additional homes so I can continue to build my collection and decorate at my own whim, right? Uh, in the meantime, I hope you learn more about mid-century modern furniture 
and too bad you're not here because you too could have some bon dieu. And Yvette Craddock, thanks Dave. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the segment of Frame. Furniture, people love it for its aesthetic value and some people just view it as a functional tool. Regardless of viewpoints, there is one truth and that is someone was behind the creation of a piece of furniture. In this segment of Frame, we are learning about the creative and design process involved in bringing a piece of furniture to life. Joining me is maker, craftsman, and overall creative force, Todd Sabin. Todd, welcome to Frame. Thank you. Thanks for having us in your studio. It's like this very place playland. I love it. I've worked hard on uh, making all this stuff, and it's, it's been quite a creation. Give them an idea of your background in making things. Okay. Well, I Please. was raised in a family that uh, we always made things, and uh, mostly agricultural farming, and uh, my father was a craftsman, my grandfathers were craftsmen, and uh, they passed down the traditions, and I started from an early age with making furniture, making even my own toys as a child, wow. and that morphed into furniture, and uh, luckily I've spent the last 37 years making things for a living. Uh, and you have extraordinary pieces. It's really interesting to talk to you because I feel like we're going back to that maker period in life and I know my brother had wooden toys growing up and I'm seeing those types of toys come back and then people just you know getting their hands dirty yeah. so to speak and, and creating something out of nothing if you will. Yes. You even repurpose a few items such as what you have here on your workbench. Yeah. Will you please I, tell us I about this? I repurpose a lot of things. I. You know, I never had a lot of money for materials, so um, it was always around what I found or what I could uh, uh, put together. Or uh, in this case, this is actually a grate, a uh, cold air return or a heat grate that came out of the Carnegie Library when they were remodeling it for the Museum of Art. Here in uh, Cedar Rapids, correct? Here in Cedar Rapids. Uh, it was in the dumpster. Cool. I couldn't believe that nobody wanted it. So I pulled it out of the dumpster. I've done quite a bit of dumpster diving in my life to find <laughs> pieces, and I, I will dive deep for the right piece. Hey, this is worth diving for. <laughs> and heavy, but so is at the bottom. But uh, So it's been around, well, since uh, probably 1990. And finally, I, I redid the front of the Irish Democrat, and I ended up with some nice old growth redwood, and I thought there was just enough to go around the top of this, and so I've made this frame. I have just enough for the aprons, which there'll be a top and a bottom apron, and then I've recycled, I had all these short pieces of cedar wainscoting, tongue and groove wainscoat, wainscoting, that'll be the transitional piece that'll go in between the two. So it's a, it's a neat piece, recycled, old growth, redwood it's it'll be fine outside uh, that's that's what I do though I, I this in this case it was a happy coincidence that I had I found the grill and uh -huh. I happened to find enough wood that was just perfect for this project what's your vision for this piece a table a, a table or maybe chair, even bench? Uh, a bench yeah there uh, deck screen porch yeah, yeah. but uh, part of the part of the charm of the piece is the history of the grate so, and I do a lot, I, I, I think about the history of the wood, the mm -hmm. history of the, uh, you know, any part of the project, so it's, it's a combination. So the, those are influencing points for your Absolutely. creativity. You have a great imagination. Thanks. That's Thank I would you. see something like this and think, this is really cool, but what do I do with it? Yeah. That's, well, what I that's really probably appreciate. why it's sat around in my shop for 22 years. <laughs> why? I may be imagining, but it takes a while maybe for the gears to turn. Yeah, yeah. catch up with yourself, but at least so. the gears turn and you do make the connection. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. would just look at it and... They went dive in the dumpster, yeah, that's for well, sure. I Maybe would, you'll yeah. take me one day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know all the good dumpsters. Okay, in town. ready to go. Well, I didn't grow a few inches <laughs> as I really wish would happen, so I'm going to step down. You have another right. piece that Here's is a really interesting story. Small occasional table I made quite a few years ago. It's a little beat up. It, it endured three children growing up, so it took some <laughs> abuse. But I made this table um, out of a piece of wood that was almost identical to this. This was a beam that was taken out of a house 
that was demolished by an old friend of mine in 1946 when he came back from World War II. When I started working this, I noticed how many growth rings it had, and this beam is at least 100 years old, and this house was built in 1852. So you start doing simple math right. that this tree actually probably started growing around 1740, 1750. So I gleaned enough material out of it. I resawed it enough to make the chimney on the table, and it's got a simple just half lap base, and then I resawed enough of the pieces to glue together the top, and then I turned the top. So this is a it's piece beautiful. that the history of the wood itself is the, the neat part of the table. I try to combine the historic, uh, if I can get some history with the wood or a, combining that with a real piece, that's kind of where I'm... That's what you do? Yeah, that's what I do. Do you ever sketch your designs or uh, do you just dive Not in? very often. Now, in a case like this table, since I didn't have very much material, that kind of drove how much I could build. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like you're going to take a piece like this and say, I'm going to make a dresser. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in this case, you know, you had to scale the project to the... Uh, the amount of material, but I just kind of go with the flow and... <laughs> you make it sound and look so easy. Well, you know, like, yeah. where do I begin with this? <laughs> where well, would I start? Yeah, it's, uh, I guess, experience. You had talked about kind of the aesthetic and fashion side of this, but you also had a really functional idea for oh. this piece. <laughs> Getting well, I, back to my whole, fun, yeah. some people view furniture as fashion, fashionable, some people just, hey, it's just something I sleep in, sit on, or whatnot. Right. But this was pretty cool. Well, I thought that this would be cool if you had a deck or if, if you had a, a, a three seasons, four seasons porch. People are spending more time outside. They, yes. they go out earlier in the spring. They, they stay out later in the fall. Now we've got fancy heaters to heat the out of doors. We've got nice kitchens out of doors, we've got outside fireplaces. Mm -hmm. So I thought with this piece it'd be neat to uh, just conceal a small little door in one side, an invisible door, and then you could take a, a very simple ceramic heater and place it inside. There's, it would generate enough heat, warm up the thick cast iron. Um, nice. you, could, you could place your warm food on it, it'd be a great place to sit when it was a little nip yeah. outside if you know with the watching the fire or eating or be a great footstool if you want to keep your feet warm while you're outside. <laughs> this is like my heat at car seat for <laughs> yeah, the outdoors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You contributed to a local restaurant that has some really interesting art and this one is maybe steampunkish a little yeah. bit. Oh yeah. yeah Propeller based. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you want to give us a story? Uh, a few years ago, um, I was asked to help design and brand a new restaurant. I did a 22 foot wooden propeller for him originally when we opened the restaurant. And then while we we're building the restaurant, uh, I had all this leftover oak. I made a simple line drawing of a large propeller started gluing up these old pieces of oak full of nails, uh, ended up with an 18-foot blank, and then I actually carved that propeller shape out of the oak. I finished, finished the propeller, did the copper portions of it, and actually built the whole motor unit, including the wooden chain, with uh, one hand. I had uh, the other hand in a cast. I, she did leave me what I joked I had a flipper and a pincer on that hand. So I had two fingers on this oh, hand no. and my <laughs> right hand. So I ended up finishing that and then uh, later hung it on the most prominent wall out at Zeppelin's. That's so, outstanding. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And then I came back and rewired the inside with, uh, it's all lit up with LED lights and there's just, there's a few found gears, uh, some agricultural gears. Uh, there's sprinkler heads, there's part of a trombone on there. It's all made out of just junk that I found. Wow. So. I wish I could tap into your imagination. <laughs> and all with one hand. Well, well I had a pencil. Well, that, I, had, I, can't, wait, I, I had, can't forget that part of it. I had two fingers on the other hand. See, so. the, this is why I stay away from those tools, mm -hmm. well, those things like that. Not a good idea. You can have no Very, fear, though. That, well, that's very true. Yeah. 
So something that you're nothing gain as you just said. That's earlier. right. All right. That's right. It's Thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. And thank you for tuning into this segment of Frame. Sponsored by Allegra, Click Marketing Solutions, Dialfolio Jewelry, Tallgrass Business Resources, 